Okie dokie. Okie dokie. <clears throat> the Wim Melanie Dark, you are the first person on Wham Now. John Wood, you are the second person. Chicken Dog 13, Coco 25, I could went too fast. Mountain Four, Ambi Cakes, Melanie Dark. John Wood, there you are. What's up? What's up with you? Pamela Morgan. Thank you, Wave. Hi. Thank you guys so much for joining Editor Christina. You're so smart. Thank you so much for joining us uh, on the women's Alzheimer's movement now. So excited you mentioned this on your live when you and Patrick were there. Mountain, thank you so much for coming on over to WAM. This is the Women's Alzheimer's Movement Instagram feed and in space. And we're um, doing this uh, these live conversations about women's health, about Alzheimer's prevention, about brain health, all of our brain health. And we're hoping that you'll discover the incredible work of the women's Alzheimer's movement by listening to conversations like this with the extraordinary Mark Hyman. Uh, last week we spoke with Drew Ramsey. We're going to be speaking with Lisa Moscone, the author of the new book on women's brains. We're going to be speaking to researchers that the Women's Alzheimer's Movement funds. And we're going to be speaking with women, who, I mean, men and women who are really devoting their life to understanding the brain, working to wipe out Alzheimer's or better understand Alzheimer's. So um, if you have a brain, you have a home here because we want people to think about their brains and how to keep their brains healthy. So if you're here, I hope uh, you will tell people about Wham Now. It's every Thursday at three o'clock. Um, always great guests. Today we're going to be having, I just wanted to come on a little bit earlier uh, to uh, prepare uh, the space for Dr. Mark Hyman, who's a friend, who's been an incredible friend of the Women's Alzheimer's Movement, who's been a big supporter. He has written 13 New York Times bestselling books. 13. Oh my God. He has an incredible podcast, Doctor's Pharmacy. He has a great website. He's always kind of on the cutting edge of health. So we're gonna to talk to him about Alzheimer's prevention, about brain health, and really what we're learning about COVID, what he's seen in his patients, what he's learning about being a doctor on the front line. So I think this will be a really good conversation. I hope it'll be an inspiring and informative uh, com conversation for you. I hope it'll give you some uh, tidbits to talk about. Uh, when you leave here um, today. Um, and I hope most importantly, it'll bring you um, up close to the work of the Women's Alzheimer's Movement. Uh, you can check it out. It has its own website. You can sign up for its own newsletter every other week. You can get the Women's Alzheimer's News Brief, brings you up to date on what's going on in terms of brain health, in terms of Alzheimer's, in terms of women's health. It's a must have resource. And um, this site is also a must go to, must have resource because it gives you information um, that is good for your brain, good for your heart, good for your mind, good for your body, and good for your soul. So that's the goal here. And um, I'm really excited that Mark Hyman, who has a new book out, it's already on the bestseller list. It's called Food Fix. It came out right at the kind of beginning of this pandemic, but. Um, it came out just in time to hit to the New York Times bestseller list. So, um, and he continues his work on the front lines, as I said, of health um, all the time. And I really enjoy always uh, everything that he's talking about, everything that he's always doing. Um, he's not there yet, but um, other people are. So uh, he's, he wasn't supposed to come on till three. And, oh, Melanie Dark, turned 50 on Tuesday. I know it's important to inform myself about aging well and maintaining brain health. You're absolutely right about that, Melanie Dark. So I hope you'll go to the Women's Alzheimer's Movement. I hope, I'm so glad to welcome you here to Wham Now. I hope you will um, follow this account because it brings you brain health tips every week. It brings you stories on uh, Alzheimer's prevention. It gives you tools that you can use in a kind of day-to-day. Up -day. Oh, there is Mark Hyman. And it says, wave, join. It says, Mark Hyman. Mark Hyman, there he is. 
I don't want to keep him waiting because he's one busy guy and he sees patients, even though um, he's, a oh, there he is. Hi, Mark. Hi, how's it going? Good, how are you doing? I'm great. I'm uh, tucked away in the Berkshires. It's still snowing here, believe it or not. <laughs> oh my God, well, I'm in Los Angeles. It's about 90 degrees. So are, oh, you, safe? Wow. are you okay there in the Berkshires? I'm great. Yeah, we're, we're hunkered down. I'm being very safe. Uh, and I uh, taking care of myself, focus on making myself COVID-19 resistant. So how do you do that? Let's talk about <laughs> that. How do you become, that's what everybody wants to know. How do you become yeah. COVID-19 resistant? Well, you know, as a functional medicine doctor, I've focused for decades on how do we create a healthy human being where disease right. can't land, right? Right. And I think what we're learning, which is pretty frightening when you look at the data, is that the people who are being hospitalized, the people who are being in the ICU, 94% are overweight or obese. And, and the chronic diseases that people are suffering from that make them susceptible are all caused and, and by our diet. So our, in a way, COVID-19 is a diet-related disease because if you are overweight or obese, your immune system doesn't work as well, you can't fight the virus as easily, you won't respond as well to the vaccines, you shed more virus, you spread it more easily, and you are pre-inflamed. Your body is just inflamed. And that's what kills people from COVID-19 is the inflammation. So basically, when you, when you look at the cause of all that, the cause is our diet. It's our ultra-processed, high sugar and starch, junk food diet that America's eating, which is 60% of our calories. And that's frightening to me that we have like 42% of paid people in this country are obese, and 75% are overweight. So this is sort of like the disease landed in a population that was primed to really create a catastrophe. And that's really why we're seeing the catastrophic thing. So the, the way to protect yourself and make your COVID, yourself COVID-19 resistant is to eat real food, is to eat a lot of plant foods that have all these powerful medicinal properties that can actually help you fight the disease that are antiviral properties, like ginger and garlic and spices and curcumin and uh, all these pre and probiotic foods that keep your gut healthy where 60% of your immune system is. And, and I've written a whole article about how to, people can learn about this. It's, it's to go to drhyman.com forward slash C19 for COVID-19 and they can read how to make themselves COVID resistant. And it's exercise, it's sleep, it's stress reduction, meditation. But the diet is such a key thing because if you can control your inflammation and your metabolism through your diet, it's really powerful. So we're hearing a lot about, I mean, there's obviously some young people who have gone in and, and been, and who don't, who are not overweight, who are still impacted, but we are hearing a lot about pre-existing conditions, whether it's yeah. high blood pressure, uh, whether it's diabetes and other situations. But we're also hearing that this disease seems to be impacting men uh, yeah. more than women. And at the Women's Alzheimer's Movement, we look at Alzheimer's <laughs> as impacting more women. It's and we're true. trying to yeah. understand what's going on in women's brains. What do you think is, is there something that we can learn about women and men and brains and bodies from this disease? Uh, I don't know, but you know, men do have more heart disease, right? And I think, I think there is an increased susceptibility to lack of self-care, to more belly fat, which is the dangerous fat uh, that guys get. And that may be the risk factor here. And you mentioned that a lot of people are going in and are, are normal weight. And there's a thing called normal weight obesity or metabolically obese normal weight. So they're thin on the outside, but fat on the inside. So if you eat a lot of sugar and starch and junk food, even if you don't gain weight, on the inside, your body metabolically is like someone who's obese. And it's 40% of the thin people. So when you look at the, the total country, there's only 12% of us that are metabolically healthy. <laughs> That's 88% yeah. that are not even the thin ones. So I think that's what we're seeing, these underlying issues that are driving this. And for men, I think there is probably increased susceptibility to insulin resistance and prediabetes. And, and that's what we're seeing a lot of. And we've, we, you and I have talked in the past about prediabetes and insulin resistance being a pathway to Alzheimer's. Many people on here are talking about, you know, I'm 50, I'm in my late 40s, I'm starting to think about my brain health. What do I do? And what kind of doctor can actually help me with my brain health. So if you were to give people the three most important things they could do today about their brain health, what would they be? Well, it's, it's a great question because I was on a three hour call today with us against Alzheimer's, hearing uh -huh. some of the world's experts talk about different research that's being done on how do we prevent Alzheimer's. And we talked also about how to treat it. And there's really amazing stuff going on. 
And, and it, it was the obvious stuff that the only thing that really works and drugs are really not cutting it is, is comprehensive lifestyle change. So diet is the number one thing. And I think the, the studies that have been really good, for example, you, you help support Richard Isaacson's study and yeah. they used you know, high fiber, low carbohydrate, sugar and starch diet. And they saw really great improvements. It was really quite stunning what they showed. It wasn't a randomized trial, but it was, it was really an incredible study. Uh, and they looked at you know, eating more nutrient dense food. So they had people eating polyphenols and antioxidants in their diet. So lots of colorful, rich, colorful vegetables and the right fat. So diet is so critical. And it's essentially what I call the vegan diet, which is kind of a joke because it's kind of poking fun at the extremes of paleo and vegan, right? right. So, so I'm like, it's basically eat a lot of plants. It doesn't mean being plant-based, it means plant-rich, which is a lot of colorful fruits and vegetables that have all the protective nutrients in them. So there are a whole class of protective foods we wanna be eating. Lots of the good fats, olive oil, avocados, nuts and seeds, lots of omega-3 fats because your brain is made up of fat. Lots of fiber for your microbiome because your brain and your ba and your and your gut are connected. So you want to eat lots of, of uh, fiber-rich foods, which are also plants and whole grains and beans and nuts and seeds. And you want to make sure you're eating also, uh, you know, good quality food. It's not highly processed. So get rid of all the junk and the starch and sugar processed foods. If you're eating animal foods, try to eat, you know, sustainably raised, organic, regenerative, uh, grass-fed. Or, if you can. And, and there's a lot of great resources for people. You can do it at a fairly low cost. I mean, there's a company called Mariposa Ranch in California that's a ranch that creates regenerally raised beef. But, you know, it's, you can buy like beef on an average for grass-fed beef for basically $8 a pound on average, which is pretty cheap. So, so diet is really great. the sense. Yeah, you talk a lot about your new book. It's called Food Fix. And you talk about yeah. kind of the government and its role in food, but you're yeah. really about empowering individuals oh, yeah. to yeah. take control of their own diet because that will change what they remember, how they think, the clarity. Oh my God, yeah. So how, it's so- people how you do, how, you know, a lot of people are like, oh, you know, you wrote a book about what the heck should I eat, right? You and I have talked about people are so confused, really. Should they be yeah. eating paleo, you know? How do yeah. you- Kind of simplify it for people, especially when they're at home right now. Well, it's, you know, I think what's what's happening is I, I read a New York Times article that kind of disturbed me was that a lot of people are eating comfort foods. Um, yeah. There was another article that talked about how people are actually in the kitchen cooking. So we're all at home. We all have more time. We're not traveling. We're not eating in restaurants. So it's a time to actually dig in to get your cooking and kitchen skills up and use real ingredients. So make food from scratch. Uh, it's, it's, if you if you can start cooking from scratch, even simple food, it's so much better for you. And, and people should not be intimidated. All you need is watch a cooking video or a little thing on YouTube or you follow a recipe, you know. Someone said, how did you make that? I'm like, I just followed the recipe. I don't know, like, how did you make chicken tikka masala? I'm like, I never made it before, but it's like my mom said, if you can read, you can cook, right? So right. just sim really simple stuff. And I think, you know, it's easy to sort of fall in the trap of I'm just going to eat comfort foods because I'm stressed, but it's the worst thing you can do right now because it makes you more susceptible to COVID-19. Mark, so how do I, you get people, how do you think you can get people, I talk to so many people who say like, I just don't even think about my brain. I, I yeah. take it for granted, you know, I look at my thighs or I look at my stomach or something, but I just don't think about my brain. Yeah, if, you're, if your brain got wrinkles or, uh, you know, yeah. a muffin top, then you'd really... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, seriously. But, but how do you but get the, your patients to think about their brain health? Well, I, I think people are, are worried about dementia and their memory and their brain and brain fog and their cognitive function, and their mood. And I think, you know, I help them try to understand that this is their most important asset. I mean, you can get a new heart. You can't get a new brain, you know. Yeah. Uh, and I, I think it's, it's a really important thing to communicate to people that they, they are empowered. I mean, I, I just met with a family uh, where they had uh, the the... the, the uh, there, I think there was her mother has early dementia. Her sister had dementia. Her mother had dementia. Her grandmother had dementia. She's got the APOE4 gene. Her daughter has double four, double four APOE, double four. Wow. And they're like, want to be proactive about it. So they thought, well, what, why should I bother testing? Why should I look at this? It's, it's, there's nothing I can do about it. I, you know, I can prevent heart disease, but I can't prevent dementia. And it's just not true. We know the food diet, exercise, stress reduction, your social relationships, your brain activity, all these things play an enormous role in your cognitive function throughout your life and, and as you age. So I think, I think helping people understand that, that their brain is something that they can do something about and then they can have an impact on is, is a revelation for people. I think people don't understand that. They know I can lose weight, I can 
you know, prevent heart yeah. disease and I can get my blood pressure down. I need salt. But like to think that we can actually impact the course of our brain health over our life. It's not a, a normal thing for people to think about. So how do we get them to think about it? I mean, you're out there talking uh, all the time. You have a podcast. You're going around with your book. You're traveling more than I do. I'm out <laughs> talking all the time about women, about Alzheimer's prevention, about brain health. And every time I seem to go out, people are like, wow, I never heard this before. I never, yeah. I never kind of thought about that before. You feel kind of like you're knocking on a wall a little yeah. bit. I, I think you're right. I think, I think you know, um, I, I think that, you know, we could do a lot more from a governmental point of view to educate people, public service announcements. I think we could, we could do a lot more. You're doing with Women Against Alzheimer's Movement. There's Us Against Alzheimer's. There's a lot of people doing this, but I just don't think people are aware. And I think also people are, are not really empowered to understand that they have control over their destiny and their health, that they sort of feel victims of what's happening. And even with this COVID-19 thing, I think people are not grasping how much in control they are, whether they get sick and how sick they get. And, and I think that's really an important sort of um, thing for people to wake up to is that they, they have the power. And I, I think I do my best as I can. I write books, I do podcasts, I speak, I talk about this all the time. And yeah. you know, hopefully more people are getting it. Uh, but it's, it's, it's a slog, you're right. You know that here at the Women's Alzheimer's Movement, we try to look at, we try to fund research into women's brains to kind of close the research gap that exists about women's health. Uh, you see a lot of women patients what do you think is the kind of big gap when it comes to women's health? What is it that women don't know about how they age? What is it that we don't know about women's brains and how they might be different and how they age differently? Well, any, anybody who's been in a relationship with a woman who's a guy knows that uh, women's brains are different. <laughs> so. Oh, you're going to get in trouble. <laughs> but that's not in a bad way. I, I find they're way more insightful. They help me kind of see myself better. They tell me the truth. They, I mean, it's not a bad thing. It's a good yeah, thing. They have, okay. they have much, yeah. much more wisdom and insight than I do. So for a yeah. dumb male, it's, it's good to have a woman around. <laughs> I didn't mean it in a derogatory way at all. <laughs> but what is that? Because so many women who are in their 50s and their 60s uh, tell us they go to the doctor and the doctor doesn't know anything about hormones. They go to the doctor and they mm -hmm. don't know about osteoporosis. They go to the doctor, yeah. they don't know anything about dementia. They go to the doctor, they don't know anything about brain health. Yeah, it's true. I mean, it's a bigger question, Maria, you're talking about, which is what is our medical establishment teaching our doctors to learn? And, yeah. and what, is, what is this sort of conventional paradigm? And, you know, we're a reactive system. We're not a proactive system. You know, we focus on treatment of things at the very end of the spectrum and not at prevention early on, or even thinking about how do we create health? I mean, I, I, I didn't take a class in medical school that was like, how do you create a healthy human 101, right? It's like, yeah. there was no class in that. And, I, and you go to the doctor, how do I create health? How do I give them brain health? They don't know. They like eat better, exercise, sleep. You know, they'll just tell you the basic platitudes, but, but they don't really understand how to I diagnose what's really going on underneath and how to find what's going on. That's what functional medicine is so powerful for because it really provides a new roadmap for people to think about their health based on what we're learning in science now, which is that everything in the body is connected, that is one system, that we have influence over it through everything we do. And the microbiome is such a great example of how this is blowing up our conceptions of disease. I mean, how does the gut flora play a role in depression or cancer or heart disease or diabetes or even autism? I mean, they're doing fecal transplants on kids who have autism and they're getting better. Like, think of the implications of that for your brain. You know, when you, when you think about Alzheimer's, where is the inflammation coming from that's causing a lot of the brain dysfunction? So right? it's your from... best advice then to women and men, really, to anybody who's thinking about brain health is to first and foremost, check your diet, right? Check, Absolutely. Check... I mean, it is, it is the most important thing. And I think there's a lot of data on that, whether it's the finger trial or the mind trial or the men trial or you know, other studies that are going on now. There's, there's just such evidence that this plays such a role and it's, it's yeah. an easy thing to do. And it's, it's not just, the thing is, there isn't like one diet that cures Alzheimer's, but it's gonna cause heart disease. Another diet that's gonna prevent heart disease, but causes cancer. It's like, there's a way of eating for human beings that is going to create health across the spectrum of diseases. And that's really what, what I've written about and talked about. And it's, it's so not hard. I mean, I basically give lectures in churches and I, Rick Warren, I got up in his church. And I said, really easy to figure out what to eat. Just leave the food that man made and eat the food that God made. You know, and I, and yeah. I, I said to the, 
And I said, it's not, it, it, did God make a Twinkie? No. Did God make an avocado? Yes. Yeah, it's, it's a pretty easy distinction that anybody can figure out, right? Uh, I and like if it's that. a package. Eat the food that man made and eat the food that God made. Yeah. And they're all, they're all like, they were so overweight. They, they lost a quarter million pounds in a year doing it together. I said, you know, if you believe God lives in you, why are you feeding him crap? <laughs> you know? And, and, uh, <laughs> and they all laughed, you know, like, you're right. I said, if Jesus came to dinner, what would you feed him? A Big Mac fries and a Coke? Probably not, right? So, so you're, you're really advocating also, so like the, the diet and the way of living for brain health is equal to the diet and the way of living for brain health and the diet and the way of living to your best chance of preventing COVID, right? All of yeah, these things all of it. Absolutely. Are, are linked, right? Yeah, and that absolutely. you're giving also with food fix, you really wanted people to understand and correct me if I'm wrong, that you're kind of and you're trying to start a movement of, yeah. of to recognize that many of the choices that presented to them aren't actually their own. Well that's right. I mean we're seeing, you know, we're seeing certain communities really ravaged by COVID-19, you know, in yeah, some communities where there's 30% African-Americans, they, re they represent 70% of the deaths, even though they're only 30% of the populations like in Chicago and Louisiana. And those populations are targeted by the food industry. Their communities are food swamps and food deserts at the same time, right? They have all the bad food and none of the good food. Uh, and they are, they are really uniquely affected by this. So it's really a social justice issue around these communities. And I think a lot of this has to do with the food that we are actually producing in our food system across the spectrum. And it's affecting everybody. It's not just those communities. But like, like I said, 75% of us are overweight. And so we really create a food system instead of food policies that are driving the production of processed food, which is 60% of our calories because of what we're growing, soy, wheat, and corn that get turned into all sorts of different color, sizes, and shapes of extruded food-like substances, right? And then right. And we're, when we're even funding through food stamp programs or SNAP for those poor communities to get those foods. So they're getting $7 billion for soda and you know $70 billion for junk food every year, which is great for those companies that are selling it, but it's terrible for the people who are eating it. And we want to deal with hunger, but it doesn't mean we can't provide good nutrition and deal with hunger at the same time. They're not mutually exclusive. Uh, and yeah. we are seeing our, our basic uh, you know, dietary guidelines are for healthy people in this country, right? Which is 12% of the population. <laughs> So even our dietary guidelines aren't really good enough for people who are, are, are needing the, the right information. So we have a set of policies that are really undermining our health. We have, they're not, it's, not, it's not that they were malicious in the, in the sense that they were designed to create ba bad outcomes. They were just the good ideas at the time. We, we wanted to grow a lot of starchy calories to feed a hungry world in the 50s. We thought industrial agriculture was good with pesticides and chemicals and fertilizer, but it turns out it's not so good. It's not good, good for us. It's not good for the climate. That's bringing all these secondary downstream consequences that we have to now fix. Mark, are you are you hopeful that we'll uh, find some cure for Alzheimer's? Are you hopeful that people will be able to age uh, with their brains and their bodies intact? Absolutely. I mean, I, I think uh, I don't think it's going to come in a pill. <laughs> That's the problem. I think everybody wants what's the pill? statins don't cure heart disease right that's the best drug we have for heart disease right it helps but it's it's not the cure the cure is what it's always been which is what you eat exercise sleep stress reduction and so forth those are the things that are going to matter and i think i think we're going to find out that alzheimer's is not one disease that it is many different uh things that manifest in one way so it could be environmental toxins like mercury. It could be in some resistance from your diet. It could be nutritional deficiencies. It could be stuff related to your gut microbiome. And it's very different for different people who have the same disease. And that's the problem with medicine is every disease we treat as a homogeneous problem. You've got you know, high blood pressure, you get the blood pressure pills. It's not like, why do you have high blood pressure? Why do you have Alzheimer's? And that's what yeah. functional medicine is. It's a way of navigating to that cause. So what, do I think we are going to get to there? Yes. I, I do think we're seeing promising Promising uh, insights, for example, Richard Isaacson, where they focus on, does this person have vitamin D deficiencies? Does this person have a B vitamin issue? Does this person you know, need to get their insulin resistance fixed? Does this person have something else that's going on that's out of balance that we can fix? So it's the personalization of medicine that's going to help us solve the problem of Alzheimer's and also longevity. So I think we, you know, we have the potential to live you know, 100, 120 years 
if if we really understood what you, is that scary to you? Yeah, well, 120. <laughs> yeah, that does kind of scare. Oh, come on, you're only I, halfway there, I think, Maria. I, I think people are scared, right? They see their parents, you know, uh, without a mind, but maybe a mm. body is good, or you know, they see you know, kind of people living older, but not living a great quality of life. So I think the challenge, right, for everybody is to live a life that's fulfilling, meaningful, healthy in mind and body, right? That's the goal. And so yeah, I think it's that's true. What people are afraid of losing their minds and they don't really, they go to the doctor and they don't really know what to do. So they're afraid. That's why there's all this hope for, like, isn't there a pill I can take? But I yeah, think there, is, you know, is, there isn't. Yeah, I mean, like if someone just posted that they, they were on any, antidepressants for 12 years. I'm just sort of watching the questions come up. Yeah. And uh, by changing her diet, she was able to get off of them. Well, antidepressants don't really work that well for so many people anyway. And the diet is such a more powerful tool. It's just hard to get people to change that and to understand the connection. And that's why I sort of encourage people to do like a, a short reset on their body, even for 10 days to clean up their diet, get rid of all the junk, put in the good stuff and let them see for themselves how differently they feel, how their brain wakes up, how their depression is gone, how their energy improves. And I think that's really, if you get a personal experience of how powerful food is, it is a game changer. And I think in terms of longevity and aging, you know, there's so much data that actually if people keep their ideal body weight, if they exercise, they don't smoke, that they live a long life free of disease and then they die as opposed to people who don't, they live very troubled, disabled lives and live, die long, painful, expensive deaths. And as opposed to, you know, being just living to be 95 and then just going to sleep and that's the end of it. You know, I think that that's possible for us as human beings. And, and I think there are many cultures on the world that have shown that. And we, we have populations that are like that in this country, but we're, we live, we live a disease producing lifestyle and, and that has to stop because it's bankrupting our country, Alzheimer's and the consequences of that are staggering economically. I mean, it's, it's more expensive to take care of someone with Alzheimer's than it is to take care of someone with cancer or heart disease. So it's, it's Absolutely. really a big deal. And it's uh, more expensive for their family. So people are asked, you can go to, where do people find a functional doctor, uh, Mark? So the well, you know, good, good news now is everything's virtual. So uh, yeah. we have a whole team. I've got a team we've been working together for over 20 years at the Ultra Wellness Center. You can go to ultrawellnesscenter.com. We're doing all virtual consults so people can find us. We work with really complicated, difficult patients or people who just want to up, upgrade their life and upgrade their biology. And, and we do a lot of work with mental health and with, with cognitive function, dementia. Like I said, I had literally had five patients last week who are all in the spectrum of risk for or have having early dementia. And, and we do really amazing work with diagnostics. And they can also look at um, functionalmedicine.com. I mean, sorry, .org. And there's a little find a doctor tab on there. But now it's all virtual, so. The one final thing, a lot of questions here about your take on hormones. Um, hormones for women? Yeah. You know, I think, I think, you know, there was a lot of, uh, back when I sort of started practicing, there was a lot of love for hormones uh, in the medical profession. Uh, there were some large population studies, the nurse's health study that showed that women who took hormones had lower risk of heart attacks. So every doctor was prescribing it. But then they did an actual research study. They did a randomized controlled trial where they get half the women hormones and half the women no hormones, and they followed them for a long time. It was a billion dollar study. And it was, it was a good thing because Bernie Healy, who was the head of NIH then, she was- It's a women's health initiative that you're discussing. Yeah, women's health initiative. And she, yeah. she was like, wait a minute, men and women are different. We better study them. And so this big study was a billion dollars. And that study showed that actually the women who took hormones had more heart attacks, more strokes, more cancer. It wasn't good for them. Uh, and they, right. used a form, they used a form of a hormone called Premarin, which is a right. uh, horse urine extract basically that's what i call pregnant mare's urine premarin <laughs> and and that that has a lot of inflammatory effects it's not a bioidentical hormone and but i think everybody stopped yeah so everybody stopped using them and then it kind of was a backlash so i think my approach with hormones is to, to treat the individual right so if that person is having symptoms if they've done all the other things that we can do to help regulate those symptoms like hot flashes or mood swings or whatever then then we'll use bioidentical hormones low dose topical for as short as period as possible. I think there is some evidence that it may benefit women in terms of Alzheimer's and cognitive yeah. function. So I think I think there it's I, I think is important is an important piece of data that we should not ignore. And I think if we can do large larger trials and show that the benefit or not, it would be great. I, I think it's gonna be hard to do those trials. They're timely expensive. Yeah. And time consuming expensive. But I I think using in, in a low risk woman, meaning they don't have breast cancer, they don't have 
or high risk of breast cancer, they're taking care of all the other things that reduce their risk of, of issues, that using low dose bioidentical hormones is, is safe and effective. And especially if you measure the hormones and you measure what's happening in these women's bodies. And in functional medicine, we do a very sophisticated analysis of your hormone metabolism, whether they're producing toxic estrogens or not, and we can adjust that with diet or various supplements. So I, I do recommend it for the right person, but I don't think we should universally say every woman should take hormones. Yeah, I think the most important thing that you're saying there is that it's personal, right? What works for me might not work for your wife and might not work for her sister and vice versa. Yeah. So kind of educating people about their own bodies to trust their own symptoms. And also to remember that even though if you may have had a parent who had Alzheimer's, that doesn't mean you're going to get Alzheimer's. And if you never had any Alzheimer's in your family, it doesn't mean that you're not also susceptible. That's right. So we need That's to right. all be thinking about our brain health and the connection between our brain mm. and our body. I just wanna tell you one last story. There's a, there's a patient I had at King Ranch years ago who was a 94 year old dentist, a woman yeah. who was a health nut her whole life. She exercised, she came to Canyon Ranch, she ate really healthy, she took her vitamins, she was like on it, right? Yeah. She had APOE double four, which is for those listening who don't know what that is, that means you are at the highest possible risk of getting Alzheimer's, about 75%. By the time you're 94, it's probably 100%. She was sharp as a tack and she was still working at 94. And the reason she didn't succumb to Alzheimer's was because she was so focused on her health her whole life. So it's an empowering story to show that even if your genes are stacked against you, you can still change the outcome. And your genes are not your pre, pre, predestiny, they're your predisposition, and you have control over that. Well, thank you, Mark Kyman. Thank you for sheltering in place with us on the Women's Alzheimer's Movement. Now the book is Food Fix. You can watch The Doctor's Pharmacy. He has 13 <laughs> books. He's everywhere. He has recipes. He does everything. He's a renaissance. <laughs> I love you, Maria. I love you too, Mark. And thank you so much. God bless you. Okay. 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 Bye, everybody. Bye. Uh, let me figure out how to. Okay. Remove Dr. <laughs> Mark. Okay. So there you had it from Dr. Mark Hyman. I think really empowering that you are in control of your health, your brain health, and your body's health. So I hope if anything, you leave this conversation thinking about feeding your brain, making sure that you are taking care of your brain in addition to your body. It's always a surprise to me when I tell people they're connected and they're somewhat surprised. So it is, uh, they are connected. And thinking about your brain health at a very early age is empowering. And I wish I had been thinking about my brain health when I was 30, when I was 40. I wish someone told me then what I know now today. Uh, your mind is important, how what you eat affects how you learn, what you remember, how you feel. It's all connected. And so <clears throat> that's a really empowering um, idea. It's an empowering belief and it's the truth. So um, I see a lot of people on here saying, you know, uh, my parent had Alzheimer's, I'm afraid of dementia. I think the best thing is for people who are afraid is to try to take control of your diet, of your stress, get a meditation practice. I've started that. Once again, I started it way too late, but it's never too late. So if you're in your 30s or 40s or 50s, or if you have a parent, please make sure that they manage their stress, that they eat for their brain, that they're constantly learning and being active. And if you're struggling um, with any of these kind of health issues, perhaps go and check out a functional medicine doctor. If you don't get answers from your doctor. The Women's Alzheimer's Movement has questions that you can ask your doctor, you should ask your doctor, and that if your doctor doesn't know it, change your doctor. Change your doctor. Some people saying turmeric uh, for dementia and Alzheimer's. Yes, it's not one thing. There's not, oh, if you just take turmeric, you won't get Alzheimer's. It's the comprehensive holistic approach. It's turmeric, it's walking, it's resting, it's sleeping, it's meditating, it's learning, it's staying active, it's remembering, it's all of these things and it's what you eat. So it's all connected. Every Thursday here at three o'clock, uh, Editor Christina is functional medicine like holistic medicine. Yes, it is. There are functional medicine doctors. As he said, you can go to functionalmedicinedoctors.org and they list functional medicine uh, doctors in your area. 
and uh, they often look at a kind of holistic approach. They do different kinds of blood tests, has been my experience. But once again, everything is individual and you should check with your own doctor because everybody has, um, you know, their own health history. So that's uh, super important. Next week, we'll be talking to Seth and Lauren Rogan here. Uh, they also are um, colleagues in the fight against Alzheimer's. They have an organization called Hilarity for Charity. This is the women's Alzheimer's movement. We are on the front lines 24-7. Uh, we are the only organization, independent organization, totally focused on women and Alzheimer's, women and prevention and brain health. And we welcome everybody to our community. We need your help, your ideas. Uh, if you want to donate, that's awesome too, because it's a tough time out there for nonprofits. Um, who are you know, working, we give out grants every year. So that depends on how much money we raise. Last year, we gave out a million dollars in grants. Some of the, uh, Dr. Hyman talked about some of the um, trials that we have funded. And uh, this work is very important. And I'm hopeful that we'll be a part or one pillar in trying to wipe out Alzheimer's in your lifetime. That's my goal, that's our mission. And we hope you join this mission, the women's Alzheimer's movement.org here on Instagram at WAM. You can sign up for the women's Alzheimer's news brief. Oh my gosh, we're doing a lot. Lord have mercy. So you can join us in all of these things, any of these things, the women's Alzheimer's movement, AKA WAM. And um, thank you for listening. Thank you for joining us today. And thank you for supporting the work, Editor Christina. Thank you, T3NISDRW. Um, let's get the government to take, make it citizens' health. That's good. Wanda McDaniel, my great friend, saying my dad would be proud. He would be proud at this moment, but then my mother would say, okay, now what? Get going. That was good, but we got to keep going. So we're going to keep going, and um, we're going to keep trying to find a cure, and we're going to keep talking to people who will bring you information that you can use. This is information above the noise, information you can use, tools uh, for your brain health. So T3NISDRW, thank you for saying you love our work. B-K-L-Y-N-A-B-A-B-I-2040, thank you for joining us today. I try to read these names as they go by. Uh, it's kind of hard, but sometimes... Uh, so the cure is holistic. There is not a pill. There is not a vaccine, but um, there is hope. And so uh, I hope you'll join us. We are cultivators of hope. We are agitators and instigators, and you are welcome to join our community. In fact, please, please join WAM now. This is called WAM now, so join us. Thank you so much, and have a great rest of your day, your evening, or wherever you are. God bless you.